Okay, so let's uh, try to get a start on our story, a uh, study in Scarlet. Uh, again, the narrator of these stories is um, Dr. John Watson. Uh, actually, his uh, full name is uh, John Hamish Watson. And he uh, takes a degree of uh, medicine uh, from the University of London in 1878. Uh, uh, and he goes through the course uh, to be a, a surgeon uh, in the army, and he has to go to a special school after college um, to get that uh, designation. So he uh, graduates from the uh, military uh, surgeon training and he is immediately uh, sent to India. And he arrives in India and come to find out his uh, regiment has been sent to a new battle front in Afghanistan. So he um, arrives there. Um, he's not there very long and he is uh, uh, shot uh, in the shoulder um, by a bullet, uh, almost dies thanks to one of his uh, uh, mates, uh, he's carried out of there and sent to hospital. Uh, he's in pretty rough shape, and he is eventually uh, sent back to England to recuperate. And he meets um, this guy named uh, Stanford. Uh, his real name is Mike Stanford. Uh, who's a doctor, and they both attended um, medical school together at uh, St. Bartholomew's Hospital. And uh, Mike uh, Stanford actually goes on uh, to teach there. Um, Stanford also knows uh, Sherlock Holmes, who uh, frequents the hospital uh, doing his own uh, experiments. So uh, Watson is talking to Stanford about how he's looking for uh, an apartment to rent. But, you know, things are a little expensive and he'd like to um, have a share, a flat share, or housemates, two housemates uh, getting together but to rent uh, uh, a fairly decent uh, place. And uh, Stanford says, hey, I know this guy, uh, a little odd, but, uh, you know, he's harmless, uh, named uh, Sherlock Holmes, who is uh, also looking for a flat share. So um, Stanford brings um, Watson the next day over to meet uh, Sherlock Holmes. So upon uh, meeting uh, Watson, Holmes says, uh, how are you? He said, cordially gripping my hand with the strength for which I should hardly have given him credit. Holmes says, you've been in Afghanistan, I perceive? Watson is amazed. He says to Sherlock Holmes, how on earth do you know that? So he doesn't get a direct answer right away. But later, they um, decide to rent an apartment together at 221B Baker Street. And in the 19th uh, century, this was kind of a high-class uh, residential district. 
Um, from the stories uh, Watson and Sherlock uh, share the Baker Street apartments from 1881 to 1904. So Watson uh, says that uh, uh, Holmes was certainly not a difficult man to live with. He was quiet in his ways and his habits were regular. It was rare for him to be up after 10 at night. And he uh, had uh, usually had breakfast and was gone before uh, Watson gets up in the morning. Uh, sometimes he spent his day at the chemical laboratory, um, sometimes in the dissecting rooms, and occasionally in long walks, which appears to take him to the lowest portions of the city. So Sherlock gets out and about. He doesn't just stay in the wealthy, nice residential area. He's walking around in the slums of London as well. And by the cast of characters that we're introduced to along the way, we can see that Sherlock Holmes knows people from every strata of life. So Watson goes on to describe uh, Holmes's physical characteristics. In height, he was rather over six feet and so excessively lean that he seems to be considerably taller. His eyes were sharp and piercing, save during those intervals in which I have alluded, uh, and his thin hawk-like nose gave his whole expression an air of alertness and decision. His chin, too, had the prominence and squareness which marked the man of determination. His hands were blotted with ink and stained with chemicals yet he possessed an extraordinary delicacy of touch. As I have frequently observed when I watched him manipulating his fragile philosophical instruments. Uh, a few odd char characters visit Holmes over the course of the next few weeks, shortly after moving into their Baker Street apartment. And Watson still doesn't quite know yet uh, what uh, Holmes does for a living. Um, it's finally revealed. Um, well, says Holmes, I have a trade of my own. I suppose I am the only one in the world. I am a consulting detective if you can understand what that is. Here in London, we have lots of government detectives and lots of private ones. When these fellows are at fault, they come to me and I manage to put them on the right scent. So uh, he finally kind of figures out what Holmes does for a living and why these kind of odd characters uh, drop by the apartment. Um, those rules of deduction laid down in that article which aroused your scorn are invaluable to me in practical work. Observation with me is second nature. You appeared to be surprised when I told you on our first meeting that you came from Afghanistan. Watson replies, you were told, no doubt. Holmes says, nothing of the sort. I knew you came from Afghanistan. From long habit 
the train of thoughts ran so swiftly through my mind that I arrived at the conclusion without being conscious of intermediate steps. There were such steps, however. The train of reasoning ran. Here is a gentleman of a medical type, but with the air of a military man, clearly an army doctor. Then, he has just come from the tropics, for his face is dark, and that is not the natural tint of his skin, for his wrists are fair. He has undergone hardship and sickness, as his haggard face says clearly. His left arm has been injured. He holds it in a stiff and unnatural manner. Where in the tropics could an English army doctor have seen such hardship and got his arm wounded? Clearly in Afghanistan. The whole train of thought did not occupy a second. I then remark that you came from Afghanistan and you were astonished. Watson replies, it is simple enough as you explain it. You remind me of Edgar Allan Poe's Dupin. I had no idea that such individuals did exist outside of stories. Okay, so back to our story. Uh, Sherlock Holmes rose and lit his pipe, and he replies, no doubt you think you are complimenting me and comparing me to Dupin. Now, in my opinion, Dupin was a very inferior fellow. That trick of his breaking in on his friend's thoughts with an appropriate remark after a quarter of an hour's silence is really very showy and superficial. He had some analytical genius, no doubt, but he was by no means such a phenomena as Poe appeared to imagine. So Sherlock is not taking the compliment that Watson says he reminds him of Dupin very well. Okay, so Watson is still a little uh, unsure that um, Sherlock Holmes has this ability to make major conclusions from little tiny bits of evidence. Um, Sherlock does describe to him how he uh, knew that uh, Watson was a uh, military man, a doctor, and had just returned from Afghanistan. And Watson understands his uh, logical conclusion, but still wants to test Holmes further. He's still thinking it might be a trick. So um, Watson finally has uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, test uh, Sherlock again, and he looks out the window, Watson looks out the window, and he sees this uh, older fellow kind of meandering down the street, and he points him out to Sherlock and says, uh, hey, uh, what do you think of uh, that man right there? What can you deduce by your form of logic about him? And um, on the next slide, uh, we're going to uh, get into detail about that interchange. I wonder what that fellow was looking for, I asked, pointing to a stalwart 
plainly dressed individual who was walking slowly down the other side of the street, looking anxiously at the numbers. He had a large blue envelope in his hand and was evidently the bearer of a message. You mean the retired sergeant of Marines, said Sherlock Holmes. Brag and bounce, I thought to myself. He knows that I cannot verify his guess. The thought had hardly passed through my mind when the man whom we were watching caught sight of the number on our door and ran rapidly across the roadway. We heard a loud knock, a deep voice below, and heavy steps ascending the stairs. For Mr. Sherlock Holmes, he said, stepping into the room, handing my friend the letter. Here was an opportunity of taking the conceit out of him. He little thought of this when he made that random shot. May I ask, my lad, I said in the blandest voice, what your trade may be? Commissioner, sir, he said gruffly, uniform away for repairs. And you were, I asked with a slightly malicious glance at my companion. A sergeant, sir, Royal Marine Light Infantry, sir. No answer, right, sir. He clicked his heels together, raised his hand in a salute, and was gone. I confess that I was considerably startled by this fresh proof of the practical nature of my companion's theories. My respect for his powers of analysis increased wondrously. There was still remained some lurking suspicion in my mind, however, that the whole thing was prearranged, intended to dazzle me, though what earthly object he could have in taking me in was past my comprehension. When I looked at him, he had finished reading the note and his eyes had assumed that vacant, lackluster expression which showed mental abstraction. How in the world did you deduce that, I asked. Deduce what, he said petulantly. Why, that he was a retired sergeant of Marines. I have no time for trifles, he answered brusquely, and then with a smile, excuse my rudeness, you broke my thread of thoughts, but perhaps it is as well. So you actually were not able to see that the man was a sergeant of Marines? No, indeed, I said. It was easier to know than to explain why I know it. If you were asked to prove that two and two made four, you might find some difficulty. And yet you are quite sure of the fact. Even across the street, I could see a great blue anchor tattooed on the back of the fellow's hand. That smacked of the sea. He had a military carriage, however, and regulation side whiskers. There we have the Marine. He was a man with some amount of self-importance and a certain air of command. You must have observed the way that he held his head and swung his cane. A steady, respectable, middle-aged man, too, on the face of him. All facts which led me to believe that he had been a sergeant. Wonderful, I said. Commonplace, said Holmes. Though I thought from his expression that he was pleased at my evident surprise and admiration. My dear Mr. Sherlock Holmes, there has been a bad business during the night at three Laurelston Gardens off the Brixton Road. Our man on the beat saw a light there about two in the morning, and as the house was an empty one, suspected that something was amiss. He found the door open, and in the front room, which is bare of furniture, discovered the body of a gentleman, well-dressed, and having cards in his pocket bearing the name of Enoch J. Drebber, Cleveland, Ohio, USA. 
There has been no robbery, nor is there evidence as to how the man met his death. There are marks of blood in the room, but there is no wound upon his person. We are at a loss as to how he came into the empty house. Indeed, the whole affair is a puzzler. If you can come round to the house any time before twelve, you will find me there. I have left everything in status quo until I hear from you. If you are unable to come, I shall give you fuller details and would esteem it a great kindness if you would favor me with your opinion. Yours faithfully, Tobias Gregson. So uh, Watson and uh, Holmes um, go to the scene of uh, number three, uh, Lauriston Gardens. And Holmes uh, does not enter the house uh, directly. He uh, spends time uh, investigating the outside uh, premises. Um, in fact, uh, he gets off about 100 yards from the house and uh, walks up the sidewalk investigating the roadway, the soil, the ruts left in the road by the horse-drawn carriage, looking for footprints. Uh, he uh, remarks to Watson that uh, it looks like a herd of uh, buffalo have been walking outside on the crime scene. He's not too happy about that. So um, Holmes enters the, uh, the building, uh, goes into the room, and sees uh, the dead body. He uh, notices blood, but uh, eventually realizes that the blood is not from the victim. So Holmes investigates the body. He smells the lips. He looks for hidden wounds. And while he's kind of moving the body around, a uh, woman's gold wedding ring is found. Um, he also pulls out uh, from the pockets some uh, business cards of uh, Enoch J. Dribbler of Cleveland, Ohio. Also two letters, one addressed to E.J. Dribbler and one to Joseph Stangerson. Um, there is money that is still there, so the motive is not a robbery. And as he's uh, investigating the room, he finds a word, R-A-C-H-E, uh, written in blood uh, on the wallpaper or wall. So um, the, they talk about it a little bit, and the uh, Scotland Yard investigators uh, think that it's an unfinished uh, woman's name of Rachel. But uh, Holmes says, uh, no, uh, it's a German word meaning revenge. Uh, Holmes uh, concludes his uh, investigation and uh, asks to visit the original police officer who uh, came on the scene of the crime. And that was Officer John Rance. And uh, Rance has finished his shift and uh, is now at home uh, sleeping. So uh, Holmes and uh, Watson uh, get a cab and they go over to talk to John Rance. But uh, along the way, uh, Holmes uh, sends a message or a, a telegram. And uh, 
we're not quite sure what that message is all about, but we're getting there. So um, Holmes uh, gets a couple of uh, clues uh, already from the crime scene. Now, he uh, does interrupt uh, Officer Rance's sleep, which doesn't please Rance at all. Uh, he, they talk for a while. Um, Holmes tells him, okay, so you uh, walked down the pathway uh, to the front door, then you turned around, you came back out to the street, uh, you hung around there for a couple of minutes, and then you went back to the house. Why did you do that? And Officer Rance is completely <laughs> astonished. How, how did you know that? Were you watching me? W were you there? And uh, Holmes says, well, I could just tell by the, uh, the footsteps that you left uh, in, the, uh, in the dirt on your two paths going back and forth. And Rance explains himself and says, yes, I did go up to the house and uh, I saw a light flickering there. So I went to investigate. I know that the people that were living there died of a, a disease. And uh, he says, I'm not afraid of anything on this side of life, but uh, I was a little worried about spirits and ghosts. So I went back out to the street to see if I could see the other police officer that I was talking to earlier and see if he could uh, or would come into the house with me. Well, the other officer is long gone, so Rance goes into the house himself and uh, discovers the body, and that leads to a whole bunch of policemen uh, getting there. So, uh, actually, the uh, Rance is uh, outside the house, and there is a very drunken man um, stumbling nearby. And um, Rance is going to arrest him, but he says, you know, Basically, I've got way too much going on here. I can't be bothered with you uh, right now. Uh, you know, we, we've got a, a murder at the house here, and you just go find your way home. So, um, finally, uh, other police uh, arrive on the scene, and uh, Sherlock and Watson are called to come down and investigate. So what, uh, on the way, um, sh well, okay, first, Sherlock realizes that that drunken man um, that's outside the house is actually the murderer, and he's come back uh, to the crime scene uh, looking for the gold ring that uh, uh, Sherlock has uh, found uh, while moving the body around and checking pockets and things like that. So what uh, Holmes had done was he had uh, sent an advertisement uh, to the newspapers that said that he had uh, found a gold ring uh, in uh, Brexton Road uh, this morning. And uh, between the White Hart Tavern and Holland Grove. And uh, come by to 221B Baker Street. Uh, between uh, 8 and 9 this evening, and I'll give you your uh, gold ring back. Um, Holmes is thinking that the uh, murderer will come back for the ring. 
But instead, an old woman uh, shows up to claim the ring. However, the old woman is in fact the murderer in disguise. Uh, they don't recognize this at the time. The woman leaves and Sherlock follows her thinking that she will lead him uh, to the murderer. But um, she's very crafty. She uh, actually gets away. Uh, the police, uh, in the meantime, um, have a track down uh, Joseph Stangerson, and they um, try to find uh, Drebla's address in London uh, by way of a hat that was found at the scene. So the next morning, um, in the newspapers, there are stories about the murder. Uh, they think it might be politically motivated. Um, Holmes and uh, uh, Watson are reading all the different newspaper accounts. And the next characters that enter our story are called the Baker Street Irregulars. And the Baker Street Irregulars are street kids uh, that Holmes employs for detective work. At this moment, there came the pattering of many steps in the hall and on the stairs. Accompanied by audible expressions of disgust upon the part of our landlady. It's the Baker Street Irregulars, a division of the detective police force, said my companion gravely. And as he spoke, there rushed into the room half a dozen of the dirtiest and most ragged street kids that I have ever clapped eyes on. Tension! cried Holmes in a sharp tone. And the six dirty little scoundrels stood in a line like so many disreputable statues. In future, you shall send up Wiggins alone to report, and the rest of you must wait in the street. Have you found it, Wiggins? No, sir, we ain't, said one of the youths. I could hardly expect you would. You must keep on until you do. Here are your wages, he handed each of them a shilling. Now off you go and come back with a better report next time. He waved his hand and they scampered away downstairs like so many other rats. And we heard their shrill voices next moment in the street. There's more work to be got out of one of those little beggars than out of a dozen of the force, Holmes remarked. The mere sight of an official looking person seals men's lips. These youngsters, however, go everywhere and hear everything. And they are as sharp as needles too. All they want is organization. We don't know their purpose or what information they are sent out to discover. Shortly, Holmes and Watson are visited by Inspector Gregson that has news to share on the case. Okay, so uh, Watson and Holmes are at uh, 221B, and uh, after a while they are visited by Inspector uh, Gregson that has some updates uh, and news to share on the case. Uh, he was able to find the address of the murder victim, uh, Drebler, uh, by way of tracking down the manufacturer of his hat. So when he goes to uh, Drebler's uh, address, he's uh, met by the uh, 
the landlady. And uh, she tells a story uh, that uh, Drebla had uh, come back um, late at night, uh, very drunk. Um, her daughter was present uh, when he uh, came home. He uh, grabs the daughter by the wrist and starts to uh, take her out of the house, saying that uh, she should come with him. He's going to be traveling around Europe. He can take good care of her. And she, the daughter, wants absolutely nothing to do with this. This calamity is uh, broken up by the uh, girl's uh, older brother. His name is uh, Arthur Choppenter, and he's a lieutenant in Her Majesty's Navy, young, strong guy. He uh, chases uh, Drebler uh, outside the house, chases him down the street, uh, threatening to uh, do bodily harm. He's carrying a big stick, probably wax him a few times. And uh, long story short, uh, Arthur Choppenter is uh, arrested for uh, Drebler's murder. So he certainly has a means, a motive, and opportunity uh, to do so. But um, Watson says, uh, no, it's not, uh, it's not Arthur Chapinter who killed him. Um, Inspector Lestrade uh, visits 221B uh, as they're discussing the case. And he says, quote, the secretary, Mr. Joseph Stangerson, said Lestrade gravely, was murdered at Holiday's private hotel about six this morning. Okay, so now we've got two murders. Uh, Lestrade said uh, upon entering the room, he was quite dead, had been dead for some time. His uh, arms and legs were rigid and cold. Uh, and when he turned him over, the uh, owner of the uh, hotel recognized him as being the same who had rented the room under the name of Joseph Stangerson. The cause of death was a deep stab wound in the left side, which must have penetrated the heart. And now comes the strangest part of the affair. What do you suppose was above the murdered man? Sherlock Holmes answers the word R-A-C-H-E written in letters of blood, he said. So, you know, both Lestrade uh, and Gregerson are shocked. How, do you, how could you possibly know that? You weren't there. Um, also part of the murder scene, a, um, a milk boy had been uh, passing on his way to the uh, dairy uh, very early in the morning and he walked down the lane that leads to the back of the hotel. He tells the police he noticed a ladder which was uh, usually lying on the ground uh, was raised up against one of the windows uh, to the second floor and that window was open. And after passing by, he looked back and he did see a man uh, descend the ladder. Um, he came down so quickly and openly 
that the boy imagined him to be some carpenter at work at the hotel. And he really didn't uh, take any particular notice of him. But in his mind, he was thinking that it was pretty early in the morning for him to be at work. Uh, there were some papers uh, in the pocket of uh, Stangerson, um, a uh, single telegram uh, dated from Cleveland about a month ago and contained the words, J.H. is in Europe. There was no name uh, connected to the message other than J.H. And we now have the two murder crimes to solve. Also, uh, was found at the scene a small chip ointment box containing a couple of pills. Lestrade had the pills on him and uh, Holmes uh, wants to take a look at it. Holmes looks at them. He uh, cuts uh, the pills in half and um, there's a dog in the apartment very sick, dying dog. And um, Holmes gives the dog uh, one half of one of the pills. And nothing happens. Strange. So he gives the dog the half of the second pill. And within seconds, the dog is dead. Okay, so we have a box with two pills, one very poisonous, the other seems to do nothing. Very strange. So again, uh, Holmes uh, says he knows the name of the murderer and the arrest of Lieutenant Navy Lieutenant Arthur uh, Choppenter is uh, incorrect. Okay, so uh, knock, knock, knock on the door. More guests. Uh, Wiggins, the leader of the Baker Street Irregulars, says he has a cab waiting downstairs. Holmes sends uh, Wiggins down to inform the cab driver uh, to come upstairs and help with some luggage. The cabbie uh, enters 221B, and uh, after a fierce struggle, is arrested and handcuffed. Holmes declares this is the murderer of both men. His name is Mr. Jefferson Hope. So, this is the end of part one. We definitely have means and we have opportunity. But we do not know the motive. Now, in the second part of the story, which does not take place in England, but uh, starts off in the uh, west of the United States, will uh, provide us with the motive in detail. Okay, so let me get you um, a little started off on the um, second half of the story. And uh, this is a, an example of a, a flashback in time. So the story itself uh, 
says the name of the place where we start as the uh, Sierra Blanco. But uh, that's really uh, incorrect. Um, the precise location is the Oregon Buttes in Wyoming, according to Jack Tracy's encyclopedia, Sherlock Anna. And the date is uh, 1847. So we find a single dying man aged uh, either 40 to 60. It's hard to tell how old he is because he's so beaten up. And uh, he's actually uh, cradling a small uh, female child uh, named Lucy. And they are the uh, only survivors of a group of uh, 21 pioneers uh, making their way out west. Uh, they all died of uh, starvation and lack of water. And so uh, this man, John Ferrier, and uh, the child, uh, the only two survivors. The um, child is not uh, his daughter. Um, they are uh, exhausted and uh, dying of hunger and thirst. And they find a comfortable place amongst the rocks uh, to lie down and die. But in the distance, a large group of religious refugees called the Mormons or the Latter-day Saints are on their track trying to discover a new place for their group to settle. They notice a off-color pink um, cloth up on a little hilltop. And the leader of the group sends a couple of guys out to go, what is this pink thing up there? Is it Native Americans or what's going on? It's truly out of place. So um, they go up and they discover this, these two people um, starving and dying. And um, they invite them uh, and bring them back uh, to the group. Actually, they have to carry them down to the group, to the big boss. And um, the big boss says, uh, well, here's your choice. Uh, we'll take care of you. You're welcome to come along with us. But you have to join our group and our religion. Okay, so uh, John Ferrier and the child have no choice uh, but to uh, go along and join the group and the church. So um, as a result of uh, Ferrier's uh, expertise, uh, once he recovers, he uh, distinguishes himself as a guide and a hunter uh, for the group. And uh, he ends up with the uh, Mormons that settled in Utah. And he eventually adopts uh, Lucy, uh, the young girl, as his daughter. And um, due to his uh, help uh, to the group, as a guide and hunter, uh, he's uh, granted a large tract of fertile land. And he builds a very uh, simple cabin, but uh, over time, uh, he knows how to build things and the little cabin becomes a, a huge uh, villa. So it says, uh, 
hence it came about that his farm and all that belonged to him prospered exceedingly. In three years, he was better off than his neighbors. In six, he was well to do. In nine years, he was rich. And in 12 years, there were not half a dozen men in the whole of Salt Lake City who could compare with him. So he does well very successfully. From the great inland sea to the distant Wabash Mountains, there was no name better known than that of John Ferrier. There was uh, one way and only one way in which he offended his co-religionists. Uh, no argument or persuasion could ever induce him to set up a female establishment after the manner of his companions. He gave no reasons for his persistent refusal, but contented himself by resolutely adhering to his determination. There were some who accused him of lukewarmness in his adopted religion, and others who put it down to greed of wealth and reluctance to incur expense. Others again spoke of some early love affair with a fair-haired girl who had pined away on the shores of the Atlantic. Whatever the reason, Feria remained strictly celibate. In every other respect, he conformed to the religion of the young settlement and gained the name of being an orthodox and straight walking man. So he um, survives uh, thanks to the help of the Mormons. Uh, he does uh, join the church, but he's, he's really not big on the polygamy aspect of their beliefs. And that comes out a little later uh, in our story. Um, the girl uh, grows up to uh, be a beautiful woman. Uh, and she uh, also uh, becomes uh, very good with uh, horses. And uh, one day she's out uh, riding um, and she gets caught in a herd of uh, cattle and is almost thrown uh, from the horse into a stampede. A young uh, prospector named Jefferson Hope uh, saves her. Uh, come to find out, uh, his father was friends with John Ferrier back in St. Louis. John Hope is not a Mormon. He, uh, it's love at first sight. Uh, when he meets uh, Lucy, and he uh, decides to win her heart. Um, he calls on John Ferrier that night and many times uh, thereafter. Uh, John Ferrier really likes this young man. And Ferrier had been with the Mormons for 12 years now, and news was very hard to uh, come by because they were uh, so um, isolated. And they hardly ever mixed with anyone outside their own group. But uh, Jefferson Hope uh, catches up uh, John Ferrier on all the news and what's happening in the world uh, since uh, they joined the Mormons. 
Um, Jefferson Hope is quite an accomplished young man himself. In the last few years, he was a pioneer in California. He could narrate many strange tales of fortunes made and fortunes lost in those wild days. He had been a scout, a trapper, a silver explorer, a ranchman. And uh, so uh, John Ferrier really liked uh, this young man, and uh, so did Lucy. Long story short, uh, John Hope comes to the home one night and uh, asks uh, Lucy uh, to come with him uh, when he returns in a couple of months. He's going up to his mine to uh, make some money. And uh, Jefferson uh, Hope had uh, already talked to uh, John uh, Ferrier about his plan to basically marry Lucy after he had put some money together. And uh, of course, uh, John Ferrier was okay with that plan. He really kind of wanted his uh, adopted daughter not to end up in some uh, polygamous uh, marriage uh, situation with a Mormon. So he was uh, good with that plan. And uh, Lucy was okay with the plan as well. So um, Jefferson uh, Hope uh, rides off to work his uh, mining claims. And uh, Lucy that night enters the house, the happiest girl in all of Utah. One fine morning, John Ferrier was about to set out to his wheat fields when he heard the click of the latch and looking through the window, saw a stout, sandy-haired, middle-aged man coming up the pathway. His heart leapt to his mouth, for this was none other than the great Brigham Young himself. Brother Ferrier, he said, taking a seat and eyeing the farmer keenly from his light-colored eyelashes. True believers have been good friends to you, we picked you up when you were starving in the desert. We shared our food with you, led you safe to the chosen valley, gave you a goodly share of land, and allowed you to wax rich under our protection. Is that not so? It is so, answered Ferrier. In return, all that we asked but one condition, that was that you should embrace the true faith and conform in every way to its usages. This you promise to do, and this, if common report says truly, you have neglected. And how have I neglected it? asked Ferrier. Where are your wives? asked Young, looking round him. Call them in, that I may greet them. It is true that I have not married, Ferrier answered. But women are few, and there were many who had better claims than I. I was not a lonely man. I had my daughter to attend my wants. It is of that daughter that I would speak to you, said the leader of the Mormons. She has grown to be the flower of Utah, and has found favor in the eyes of many who are high in the land. John Ferrier groaned internally. There are stories of her which I fain disbelieve, stories that she is sealed to some Gentile. This must be the gossip of idle tongues. What is the thirteenth rule of the code of the sainted Joseph Smith? Let every maiden of the true faith marry one of the elect. For if she wed a Gentile, 
she commits a grievous sin. This being so, it is impossible that you, who profess the Holy Creed, should suffer your daughter to violate it. Upon this one point, your whole faith shall be tested. So it has been decided in the Sacred Council of Four. The girl is young, and we would not have her wed gray hairs. Neither would we deprive her of all choice. Stangerson has a son, and Drebber has a son, and either of them would gladly welcome your daughter to their house. Let her choose between them. They are young and rich, and of the true faith. What say you to that? Ferrier remained silent for some time, and his brows knitted. You will give us time, he said at last. My daughter is very young, and she is scarce of any age to marry. She shall have a month to choose, says young, rising from his seat. At the end of that time, she shall give her answer. Bring him young leaves. Daughter Lucy has overheard their conversation and want no, no part of this option. She wants a life with Jefferson Hope. On the morning which followed his interview with the Mormon prophet, John Ferrier went into Salt Lake City, found his acquaintance who was bound for the Nevada mountains. He entrusted him with his message to Jefferson Hope. In it, he told the young man of the eminent danger which threatened them and how necessary it was that he should return. Having done this, he felt easier in his mind and returned home with a lighter heart. As he approached his farm, he was surprised to see a horse hitched to each of the posts of the gate. Still, more surprised was he on entering to find two young men in possession of his sitting room. One with a long pale face was leaning back in a rocking chair with his feet cocked up upon the stove. The other, a bull-necked youth with coarse bloated features was standing in front of the window with his hands in his pockets, whistling a popular hymn. Both of them nodded to Ferrier as he entered, and the one in the rocking chair commenced the conversation. Maybe you don't know us, he said. This here is the son of Elder Drebber, and I'm Joseph Strangerson, who traveled with you in the desert when the Lord stretched out his hand and gathered you into the true fold. We have come, continued Stangerson, at the advice of our fathers to solicit the hand of your daughter for whichever of us may seem good to you and to her. As I have but four wives and Brother Drebber here has seven, it appears to me that my claim is the stronger one. During this dialogue, John Ferrier stood fuming in the doorway, hardly able to keep his riding whip from the backs of the two visitors. Look here, he said at last, striding up to them. When my daughter summons you, you can come. But until then, I don't want to see your faces again. The two young Mormons stared at him in amazement. In their eyes, this competition between them for the maiden hand was the highest of honors, both for her and to her father. There are two ways out of this room, cried Ferrier. There is the door and there is the window. Which do you care to use? His brown face looked so savage and his gaunt hand so threatening that his visitors sprang to their feet and beat a hurried retreat. The old farmer followed them to the door. Let me know when you have settled which it is to be, he said sardonically. In the whole history of the settlement, 
there had never been such a case of rank disobedience to the authority of the elders. If minor errors were punished so sternly, what would be his face? You shall smart for this, Stangerson cried white with rage. You have defied the prophet and the council of four. You shall rue it to the end of your days. He expected that he would receive some message from Young as, his con as to his conduct, and he was not mistaken, though it came in an unlooked-for manner. Upon rising next morning, he found, to his surprise, a small square of paper pinned to the cover of his bed just over his chest. On it was printed in bold, staggering letters. Twenty-nine days are given you for amendment, and then... Thus day followed day, and as sure as morning came, he found that his unseen enemies had kept their register and had marked up in some conspicuous position how many days were still left to him out of the month of grace. Sometimes the fatal numbers appeared upon the walls, sometimes upon the floors. Occasionally there were on small placards stuck upon the garden gate or the railings. Twenty had changed to fifteen and fifteen to ten but there was no news of the absentee. One by one, the numbers dwindled down. Still, there came no sign of him. Whenever a horseman clabbered down the road or a driver shouted at his team, the old farmer hurried to the gate, thinking that help had arrived at last. At last, when he saw five give way to four, and that again to three, he lost heart and abandoned all hope of escape. Single-handed, with his limited knowledge of the mountains which surrounded the settlement, he knew that he was powerless. The more frequented roads were strictly watched and guarded, and none could pass among them without an order from the council. Turn which way he would, there appeared to be no avail the blow which hung over him. Yet the old man never wavered in his resolution to part with life itself before he consented to what he regarded as his daughter's dishonor. That morning had shown the figure too upon the wall of his house, and the next day would be the last of the allotted time. What was that? In the silence he heard a gentle scratching sound, low but very distinct in the quiet of the night. It came from the door of the house. With a sigh of relief, Ferrier looked down to the right and to the left, until happening to glance straight down at his own feet, he saw, to his astonishment, Jefferson Hope, lying flat upon his face upon the ground with arms and legs all a sprawl. So Jefferson Hope, John Ferrier, Lucy, they pack up their belongings. Um, Jefferson has a few horses a couple miles away. They have to leave out uh, one of the side windows of the uh, villa. Uh, there house is being watched uh, closely. Uh, they run through the fields and they do seem to get away. So uh, they are headed to uh, a place called Carson City in Nevada. And that's on the furthest western side of Nevada on the border of California. And uh, by today's travel uh, through highways and such, um, there's a, about 
700 miles. It would probably be much longer back in those days through valleys and passes, around mountains, over mountains, you name it. It's a long haul. It could take several weeks uh, traveling on horse and foot uh, to make it that far away to Carson City, which they think, and probably is true, that they, if they make it there, they will be safe. Okay, so they've made it out of the house. They've run across the field. They seem to be safe. They uh, meet up with the uh, horses that uh, Jefferson has left uh, as their getaway, and they're on their way through the mountain passes. The roads are guarded. They almost get caught on several occasions. Just by chance, they find out what the password is. If they do get uh, questioned, uh, they do have to use that at one particular point. Um, they really didn't pack very well in terms of food. That's a question mark for me. Why didn't they do that? That would seem like an important thing to have on hand. Like, you know it's going to take a couple weeks to get out to Carson City. Why didn't you bring some food or enough food with you? So, nevertheless, it's a fiction story. And the story goes on to say at, at about the middle of the second day, um, their provisions begin to run out. Now, Jefferson Hope is a hunter, so he's not too uneasy about that. And he uh, finds a sheltered, it's called a nook. It's just kind of a, a safe place between the rocks that you could kind of build a, a shelter. And he uh, piles together some branches and makes a big fire. And he leaves uh, John Ferrier and Lucy there. Um, while he goes out to hunt. Now, they are about 5,000 feet above sea level in the Rocky Mountains. And it is severely cold there at night. Uh, if you ever have a chance to see the Rocky Mountains, uh, 5,000 feet is uh, quite a height. The air is very thin. It's somewhat hard to breathe there. So, nevertheless, Jefferson Hope uh, leaves uh, John and Lucy uh, to kind of warm themselves up while he goes out and hunts some food. And the story goes into great detail about this hunting trip. Um, he's not finding any game uh, quickly. He has to travel uh, several miles to find something. He finds a big horned uh, sheep, which he kills. He can't bring the whole thing back, but he cuts off a big piece and carries it back to the, uh, the nook where he left uh, John and Lucy. Gets a little lost along the way. It's getting dark, um, cold. Uh, it takes a long time for him to get back to the campsite. He finally makes it there. And it says uh, from the story, uh, when he turned the corner, he came full in sight of the spot where the fire had been lit. There was still a glowing pile of wood ashes there, but it had evidently not been tended since he departed. The same dead silence still reigned all around. 
With his fears all changed to convictions, he hurried on. There was no living creature near the remains of the fire. Animals, man, maiden, all were gone. It was only too clear that some sudden and terrible disaster had occurred during his absence, a disaster which had embraced them all and yet left no traces behind it. The ground was all stamped down by the feet of horses, showing that a large party of mounted men had overtaken the fugitives and the direction of their tracks proved that they had afterwards turned back to Salt Lake City. Had they carried back both of his companions with them? Jefferson Hope had almost persuaded himself that they must have done so when his eyes fell upon an object which made every nerve of his body tingle within him. A little way on one side of the camp was a low-lying heap of reddish soil, which had assuredly not been there before. There was no mistaking it for anything but a newly dug grave. As the young hunter approached it, he perceived that a stick had been planted on it with a sheet of paper stuck in the cleft fork of it. The inscription upon the paper was brief, but to the point. John Ferrier, formerly of Salt Lake City 22, died August 4th, 1860. Okay, so now we know that John Ferrier was killed but there's no sign of Lucy, the horses, or anything else. Jefferson Hope returns to Salt Lake City, and he runs into a man that he knows, a, a Mormon named uh, Cowper, and they had done business uh, together before. And Cowper has informed Jefferson Hope that Lucy had been married off to young uh, Drebber and that uh, Stangerson uh, was the one who shot her father. Lucy dies uh, within a month. Jefferson Hope hears about this now in the Mormon uh, tradition, when uh, one of the wives of the uh, uh, of the family uh, dies, the women uh, in their own private um, shelter or setting uh, stay up uh, at night with the body of the deceased uh, wife. Um, Jefferson Hope uh, finds this shelter, uh, rushes in uh, to the astonishment of the women who are there. There are no guards, there are no men there. Um, they recognize him. Um, he goes to the body of Lucy, takes the ring from her finger, and uh, kisses her goodbye on the forehead. He leaves. Um, it, the word goes around the community that Jefferson Hope came back, took the ring. Uh, now Drebber and uh, Stangerson become a little worried. Uh, this guy is pretty brave. And uh, he seems to have uh, revenge uh, in his mind. Uh, as time goes by, um, Jefferson Hope tries to kill both uh, Drebber and uh, Stangerson, but he's unsuccessful. 
one attempt was to roll a large boulder down a mountain onto the path where one of the men was uh, riding by on his horse. Um, he gets thrown for the horse, but he doesn't get crushed uh, by the boulder. Another attempt, uh, Jefferson Hope shoots through the window of one of the two guys' uh, house uh, and misses. Uh, Jefferson Hope goes uh, back to the mines. He's uh, pretty worn out. Uh, he needs to make some money. Um, he's going to kill these two guys if it takes the rest of his life to do so. And he actually doesn't even care what happens to himself. Uh, he does recuperate his health and he uh, puts some money together to fulfill his revenge. So uh, as time goes by, um, within the church, within the Mormon church, there is a, a like it's called a schism, but it's a it's a separation. Some of the younger Mormons rebel against the elders. We don't really know the details of it, but uh, many um, leave the church, leave Salt Lake City, and uh, become a uh, Christian. And uh, both uh, Drebber and Stangerson are part of those younger members that uh, rebelled against the authority and left. So uh, nobody's sure where they had gone. So uh, Jefferson is uh, traveling, trying to hunt these two guys down. Uh, years passed, his uh, black hair is turning gray, but he still wanders on like a human bloodhound. And he eventually makes it to uh, a city called Cleveland in Ohio. And he really looks like a beggar at, at this point, or a vagrant. And he uh, looks through the window of a shop, and he uh, recognizes uh, Drebber. And uh, Drebber looks out the window and recognizes uh, Jefferson Hope. And uh, so he is actually kind of arrested. Uh, he's kept in jail for a couple of weeks. He's finally let go. I mean, he, uh, they really didn't, he didn't try to do anything at that particular point. So the arrest was basically just as being a, what's called a vagrant. And uh, so, you know, he's, he's uh, let go. Uh, but uh, he finds out that uh, both Drebber and Stangerson have left uh, Cincinnati and he has to continue on uh, on his journey. But he does find out that uh, both of them have left for uh, Europe. So... Um, the story now, the setting has changed. We're now in Europe. Stangerson and Drebber are on the run. They absolutely know that Jefferson uh, has not given up his uh, revenge, even though it's been many years. They uh, reach uh, St. Petersburg. Jefferson Hope is on the trail. But he arrives too late. He finds out that they have left St. Petersburg and gone to Paris. So he follows them there, where he finds out they have just left for 
Copenhagen. He goes to Copenhagen. He finds out that they have left Copenhagen and have journeyed on to London. And from here, we know the rest of the story uh, because Jefferson Hope does finally get his revenge, uh, but he is shortly thereafter arrested at 221B and taken to the police station. Um, the prisoner will be put before the magistrates in the course of the week. In the meantime, Jefferson Hope, have you anything that you wish to say? I must warn you that your words will be taken down and may be used against you. So here we are, the prisoner says slowly, I've got a good deal to say. I want to tell you gentlemen all about it. And they say, well, you know, maybe you better reserve that for your trial. And Jefferson Hope says, uh, I may never be tried. Uh, you needn't look startled. It isn't suicide I'm thinking of. And he looks at Watson and he says, are you a doctor? He turned his fierce dark eyes upon me as he asked this last question. Yes, I am, I answered says Watson. Then put your hand here, he said with a smile, motioning with his manacled wrist toward his chest. I did so, says Watson, and became at once conscious of an extraordinary throbbing and commotion which was going on inside. The walls of his chest seemed to thrill and quiver as a frail building would do inside when some powerful engine was at work. In that silence of the room, I could hear a dull humming and buzzing noise, which proceeded from the same source. Why I cried, you have an aortic aneurysm. That's what they call it, he said placidly. I went to a doctor last week about it, and he told me it was bound to burst before many days passed. It has been getting worse for the years. I got it from overexposure and underfeeding among the Salt Lake Mountains. I've done my work now, and I don't care how soon I go, but I should like to leave some account of this business behind me. I don't want to be remembered as a common cutthroat. The inspector and the two detectives had a hurried discussion as to the advisability of allowing him to tell his story, which he does. So let's tie up some of the loose end to the story story. Uh, the pills that were found at the scene, uh, one was poisonous, one was not. So at the uh, first murder scene, he gave his victim the option of taking one of the pills and he would take the other. Now, depending on who got which pill, that would kind of end the story. Unfortunately for the victim, he chose the poison pill and died instantly. Sherlock recognizes that the murder was done by poison when he smelled it on the victim's lips. The written word R-A-C-H-E, the police thought was the unfinished uh, spelling of a woman's name of Rachel has 
Sherlock Holmes deduced was incorrect and was the German word achi, which means revenge. Now, the first victim had no bloody wound. Where did the blood come from? Well, the blood came from the nose of Jefferson Hope, whose aortic aneurysm had caused a severe nosebleed, and he used his own blood to write Achi on the walls. He thought maybe this would throw the police off a little bit. We call that the red herring. And, uh, but it didn't fool our man, Sherlock Holmes. The ring on the body, that was the ring that was on Lucy's body uh, after she was forced to marry uh, one of the Mormons against her will. She dies a month later. Okay, so that kind of ties up our story, um, a study in Scarlet. Uh, 